live on the air. Good morning, good morning. I want to welcome all the listeners on WFLT. Uh, this is going to be a great morning. We have a great day. The weather forecast is saying it's going to be a, a, a beautiful day outside. So this may be a time for us to go out there and, and pick up a little trash in front of our houses and get our flower beds all set to be uh, ready for planting. But before we do anything, we always want to make sure that we uh, give credit to where credit is definitely due is to our Lord and Savior. But as we ask for prayer this morning, I want to ask for special prayers for a firefighter who's lost his life this week. Um, firefighter John, I don't want to give out his last name, uh, to, to respect for his family, but he was a great dedicated firefighter. Uh, and he will be in our lives through uh, many different things and many different challenges that we have. But we definitely want to uh, lift up this firefighter's family and his friends and the whole department. And also, we lost a true champion of the community, Mrs. Betty Hendricks. Mrs. Betty Hendricks uh, lost her. Uh, you know, she was a beautiful person. Uh, she oh, she passed this past week. Um, I went to school with her son, uh, which is a good friend of mine. Uh, and actually, Mrs. Hendricks was in my, my parents' wedding. So I've been knowing them all my life. And I want to make, make sure that we keep them lifted in prayer. Today, we have Pastor McCatherine from Joy uh, Tabernacle to be able to deliver the prayer before we engage in uh, sharing good information. Pastor. Yes, sir. Good morning to the listening audience. Uh, let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you so much for this day, the day you have made. We rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for all the provisions you've made. We thank you for all the that help us to transcend. And we just pray this morning for your blessings. We pray special for the firefighter John, his family. We pray. Pray for Betty Hendricks and all those the mayor has asked us to keep in mind in their families. We just pray that you will continue to bless this city, work with the mayor, walk with him as he transforms this city into a viable, sustainable place. We just pray for our young people that they too will become attentive to the ways of God. And we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we uplift uh, everyone in prayer, this is a time of the year that we have to maintain our focus. You have uh, people that's going to be praying down to your frustrations, your hostilities, and your anger to mislead you to craft out different agendas. But we may must maintain our focus uh, and our energies uh, to the positive things of life and, and, and just life. Is and every day we're still uh, we still have this deadly virus COVID-19 has been with us for more than two years. Uh, it has stalled and changed the way that we think and has changed the psychology of American society. Uh, we have a lot of things going on, but uh, here to talk about uh, a look that today that's been Dr. Uh, Furholden and Dr. Reynolds. I uh, brought them here every single week to be able to arm you up with the best information about how we can actually get vaccinated. Those vaccination stations that I opened up throughout the city, um, one of my churches, uh, Shallow Missionary Baptist Church, giving uh, a big shout out to uh, Dr. Pastor Daniel Moore and the Shiloh family for allowing the church to be used uh, for something beyond worship on Sundays and Wednesdays to be able to be a vaccination site and also Word of Life Church. Uh, and we'll also we talk about Bethel and, and Greater Holy Temple. Those places have opened up their, uh, their, their sanctuaries to be able to be used for their We cannot forget that. To each and every one of those individuals who's lost their life in a fight against this deadly virus in American society, by honoring them, we must protect ourselves and our family. And I'll start off with Dr. Furholden. Uh, Dr. Furholden, uh, where are we at and what do we need to be doing right now with this the new variants that's coming out? Well, the new variant thing coming out, uh, Mayor Neely, they are actually already here. Okay. Um, and I yeah, I've been letting people know. So it, it, it is now known 100% of the cases in the U.S. are Omicron or some descendant of the original Omicron um, variant. So it's Omicron or any of its sub um, variants. And if you recall, remember when Delta hit, we were all up in arms. Oh, it spread, you know, 10 times easier. Then it was 14 times easier. Then it was maybe up to 40 times easier. And then guess what? The virus is tricky. Omicron spreads even easier. That are not our consecutive weeks of increase in Genesee County, 
specifically last week, we went from 78 cases to 136 cases. In Flint, we went from 13 to 34, so we almost tripled the number of cases in Flint. And our testing positivity rate, which is a pretty good measure when the rates aren't super high, went from 4.9% to 9.3%. That means about one in every 10 persons getting tested is positive. So I just remind people, I don't care what's happening in the White House. I don't care what judge said what. Use your best layer of protection, which is between your two ears, your brain. When you are out, you should be masked if you are indoors. When you are in indoor crowded spaces, I ask people to look around and ask yourself, does it really make sense for me to be here? Do I have to be here? And if you do, you should be masked. You should be favoring places that are requiring all the people indoors to be masked. The numbers are actually now going up. This is not the time to peel back protectors. This is the Right. And we want to make sure we do that, even though we're, we're out in the full effect, you know, people are acting as if it was normal, as it was uh, 2019 prior to this uh, deadly virus uh, being out here. And it's changed the way America is right now. And we're fighting against these variances. And we have to listen to the best medical professionals and also our scientists that tell us to make sure that we do the things that's necessary to move us, our families forward. Dr. Reynolds, uh, you are in the yeah. health coalitions, uh, uh, the meetings, you are there. You came on board uh, to be able to service us here in the city of Flint to make sure uh, that we can protect uh, one another and also uh, giving us the advice to be able to uh, help us guide uh, the residents in this community to safer spaces. Uh, what do we have this week? Uh, well, uh, Dr. Furholden covered the numbers and now we have to talk about a plan. Uh, many of you know, I have a 93 year old she got her fourth, her fourth or second booster yesterday, and uh, she was ready to get it done, and so were my siblings because they move around her. And so the message is we get vaccinated to protect the ones that we love. And the message is if a woman is pregnant, thinking about getting pregnant, if someone has had a whole organ transplant like kidneys, uh, if someone has immunocompromise, uh, that means they're getting cancer treatments or they have a disease or condition where their immune system is suppressed, they should talk to their doctor about getting a booster. And for children uh, between five on up, that includes us because we're all somebody's child, uh, make sure your vaccinations are up to date. You hear us speak about COVID repeatedly, uh, but as I get older, I remember when I got vaccinations as a child, and boosters are nothing new. And so it's time for me to get boosted. So I've had my chicken pox or varicella uh, boosters. I've had my tetanus diphtheria booster. Uh, I've had my pneumonia boosters. These are more appropriate for people my age. But check with your doctor for your vaccination status. And if you can't recall anything, it's a good time to consider uh, getting your immunizations. Right. Now remember, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yeah, I was just going to say, reminding people that we've opened up the new mini stations, the rehab mini stations, that we have people there. We have opened it up to get our boosters and and or our vaccinations if we have not been yet vaccinated. This is the time to be able to do that. We made it more accessible and more easy uh, for people to get their vaccinations and their boosters uh, throughout the city of Flint. And that is part of the priority one activity that we have engaged the mandate of this community when this variance hit uh, and this pan this COVID-19 first hit that became the mandate saving lives in this community and we spared no expenses to do so uh, sorry Dr. Reynolds but go ahead I, knew, I, I thought you yes, were mm -hmm. and now we need to talk about testing because people think because the headlines say one thing uh, testing is not as important you know after you've been in a gathering after you've done travel three to five days later, you need to go get tested because you can be an asymptomatic carrier. In other words, you have no signs or symptoms of being infected. So it's, it's easy, it's painless, go get tested. Or if you have a home test kit, find out how to do that test or get somebody who can do it for you and test yourself. Uh, if you have symptoms, stay home, put on a mask, 
Uh, and you may want to, well, you should kind of, because we do have treatments that will uh, take care of COVID-19 infection and reduce the risk of hospitalization. There are treatments, but you must do it within five days of symptoms starting. Right now, so, now, now question. Okay. Yes, sir. Your question, I've, I've, I've um, witnessed um, several people who contracted the virus. Uh, they recovered from the virus, but they still have ongoing um, uh, symptoms, not symptoms, but uh, conditions as a byproduct of the virus. And, I, and and sometimes the people, they catch the virus, uh, they have, uh, they get through it and they, they pass away. Is, is there any correlation with that, of what uh, some after effects from having COVID-19 that still causes havoc in your body? that causes you to uh, still uh, perish as a byproduct of catching the virus? Well, not necessarily death, but death, but significant disability. We call that symptoms of uh, the sense of smell, fatigue. I mean, you feel good one day and the next day you're wiped out. Uh, brain fog, the inability to concentrate and do some of the things that you did. So, yes, it can affect your body. It can affect your heart. So our goal is to prevent these things. Uh, it can, if you have a lung condition, post-infection, your lung condition can get worse depending on how extensive the damage was uh, due to the COVID infection. So that's why it's important to stay up on your medications. If you have risk factors like lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, uh, you should stick with your treatment. Uh, make sure your prescriptions are refilled. And as Dr. Furholden said, when you go to a situation, think. Does it make sense for me to be here? Leave if you must be there. Put on an N95 mask. Yeah, now, doctor, this is a question because I want to make sure we clarify this because the best defense is not to catch the virus. Uh, but definitely, if we want to be vaccinated, uh, if we have to fight off this virus and, and the chances of us fighting off the virus uh, more successfully is if we have been vaccinated and boosted. But but people still can have after effects, even if they catch the virus, especially with underlying conditions. And that's what I don't want people to believe that if you're uh, vaccinated, you become bulletproof from this virus. And so um, get vaccinated, get tested, but definitely make sure let's try to prevent the spread and you catching the virus. Is that the best defense, Doc? Uh, yes. And always remember we're talking about layers of protection. So vaccination is the foundation for prevention of complication from COVID. Doing things like washing hands, avoiding crowds, maintaining physical distancing. Uh, don't get caught up in do we need to wear a mask on an airline or not. You better think about what you're doing as you walk on the ground every day, as you walk through the airport. Wear a mask when in doubt. Now, also, uh, I heard on the news they're they're still working through vaccinations for younger people uh, from zero to five. And on the line with us now, we have uh, Mrs. Tut, which is which is an educator, uh, and she's working in education on in uh, in the classroom in a brick and mortar building with the young people. Uh, and so, but that is one of the challenges. But the psychology and the uh, that we're working with young people that they've all we all have been traumatized in many different ways and many different levels and so working through the traumatization and also with these young people mrs tut uh, i'll bring you to the, the conversation now what are you experiencing in the building uh where your educator are at right now um i'm seeing Students come to school and it's clear that their parents have instilled their politics into the students. Um, and so I would just make two suggestions uh, while we're on this path of making recommendations. Um, parents, please understand that COVID is not about your personal policy. Um, it's about the safety of others. So please be mindful of that. Um, understand that teachers have families too. Other students have health situations. We have students that have asthma and you know other health concerns and so while you may have your own personal political about whether to mask or not or whatever like there's other people 
people that are involved. Students are in close quarters, have the doors closed for safety reasons. And um, we're, you know, rooms are not always well ventilated and we do the best that we can to take care of those things. sanitized and students are kids, you know, um, so they don't have the best <laughs> hygiene habits all the time. And then the other aspect is children come from different household circumstances. So, you know, they see a lot at home and they don't want to talk about everything that's going at home, but it plays out in the classroom. And so um, one thing that I would recommend to educators is to just be mindful of that as well. Sometimes we get so you know, um, bogged down with, with mandates that we have to enforce from our administrators and from the higher up the superintendents and whatnot. And that's understandable. State mandates trickle down to the classroom, but we can't be so focused on those educational mandates, testing and so forth, that we forget that we're, we're in the business of uh, human equity. You know, um, we have to, we have to kind of have this that get into our classrooms. Um, the climate in my classroom is sort of like grandma's house where I'm not that that old oh, grandma yet. So we have a, I'm auntie, I'm auntie tut in my classroom and they're all my nieces and nephews and some are my sons and daughters. So if they need lotion, if they need, um, you know, if they need ankles with ash, I'm gonna tell them, you know, that's that sort of thing. So we have to provide, um, you know, compassion, concern, provision, and just care, you know, and sometimes we just get so caught up in, what are your test scores? And that does matter, but they're not going to perform to the level that we want them to perform if their hair is out of place or if their feeling is secure, you know, those sorts of things. And sometimes they're getting so um, beat down at home with verbal abuse or mental abuse or just seeing things between their parents or, you know, maybe a parent that's absent or just different things like that. And being in an environment like play, I grew up here and sometimes students don't even know how to articulate them. Um, you know, I've lost 35 students to violence, and teachers don't get a chance for more. Teachers don't get a chance to take days off for bereavement. We have to go straight to work the next day. And those students sitting next to those empty desks, that stuff hits hard. And we don't, you know, we have grief counseling or whatever, but it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, play out the way that people think it does on paper, you know? Um, and it, it lasts a long time. And then no matter, like, they could be going through other things on top of that at home. So when you add COVID on top of that, where you're telling them constantly, pull a mask up, pull a mask up, and then you add to that, take your hood off, take your earbuds off, put your cell phone up, and then you're adding to that, what was your test score last week? Do you get what I'm trying to say as far as the pressure? Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Yeah. The care is it's always work. Yeah, you know, they can't get it because of hope. Right, but that brings me to the next question. But because we talk about psychological traumatization of a community and a society that's been tra traumatically impacted, especially the city of Flint, who's been going through the intersection of crisis, you know, a financial crisis, a water crisis. Uh, health crisis, civil unrest here, and then we have sometimes, you know, we have to we have to gravitate toward the positive versus going to the lowest common denominator. And when you're working in the classroom with the children, you guys have been working on some initiatives to be able to engage those kids in those social spaces, uh, to be able to improve the, the quality of life in their first between uh, their left ear and their right ear, and educating them, but also the psychological traumatization in which they're viewing America. Uh, you know, ninety. 5% of the homicides in the city of Flint last year was retaliatory. Uh, you just said that you lost a, a great number of kids uh, through violence. I would assume that's what you're seeing. Uh, how are dealing with work, working with the young people? Uh, when the young people are, are, are looking at society, looking at the things on TV and social media, and even looking at some people that's placed in positions that's not acting or doing the things that's providing good role models for those young people. How, how is teachers combating that as frontline fighters? Um, well, I can't speak for all teachers. I can just speak for myself um, because, you know, teaching is kind of like you do what you do in your own room and you do what's assigned to you. And all teachers are not the same, to be honest. You know, um, 
So one thing that I have done is um, created a leadership initiative called Connect Our City. And I, we have lesson plans where we reenact situations. So if a student gets challenged for violence, how are you gonna how are you gonna avoid that? So the whole challenge of the whole goal of the lesson is to avoid violence. I give you a scenario. Um, why do you think you fight? Your goal is to not fight. Um, so they have that's their assignment. You know, create a skit, an uh, impromptu skit. This is your group, and you have to avoid violence. Um, one thing that I did years ago was uh, a tribute to students that were lost to violence. It's called Gone But Not Forgotten, and we held it at Northwestern. We had um, a full house, we had security, and all that. And I went around to the schools and held auditions. And the students were able to um, to voice how they felt, and they were able to uh, share their talent through the arts, and they were able to, um, you know, the this was when um, this was when uh, Rayana that had been um, she was um, lost to violence by her boyfriend um, at Apple a while back, and she was a drum major for Northwestern. But the Western band, marching band, um, did a, a trip for her, and there were some other as well. And they were just able to like get their grief out through their arts in a positive way. We had some other local officials, and um, um, Marable, Judge Marable was there, and some other people. Um, Sheriff Hale spoke, and some other people. And then we did a balloon release at the end. I think it's important to transmute that energy in a positive way, so you know, so students can know like. These things happen, but we can rise above these circumstances and we can do something positive um, with all of this. We don't have to just be stuck in this grief and in this violence. And right. we can choose better. Um, there was a pledge made at that point, um, but to carry it forth, you know, is important. So through the classroom, we can, you know, do activities with our lesson plans and we can teach them how to, you know, it, it takes and showing them, taking time out and showing them how to argue, showing them how to argue without fighting. You know, right, um, and I want to I want to commend no faith in the standards. Okay? Right, I want to commend you as an educators because you are the frontline fighters, uh, educating our young people, and just some of the projects that you have worked on personally is is a tremendous uh, impact on on our future because. Uh, kids emulate what they do see and they cannot become what they cannot see. And so as a mayor of a city, as a former state legislator, as a former city council person and a retired uh, person in the profession of, of, of broadcast engineering, I've always tried to make sure mentorship was very important and working with young people is very important. We cannot provide uh, a good examples for our young people when we're engaging in strife and, and um, uh, ill intent. Uh, and so those are the things that you know uh, we need to push away from so our kids won't sink down into what i call the new neck and so see and i want to just take take that thank you mrs tep for the work that you're doing and i'm a supporter uh that's why i had you here today to talk about our future and to talk about the educational quality that we're providing our young people in low to moderate income areas or communities of challenge we are all there right now as we look throughout america you know 611 mass shootings last year 248 uh, school shootings. It's easier for kids to get their hands on an assault weapon than it is for them to get an iPad or some uh, educational tool. We have to push away from that. And we cannot minimize who we are as a community, especially African-Americans. We have to lift up and educate people like Floyd J. McCree, 1966, the first African-American mayor elected to a major metropolitan city in the country, right here in the city of Flint. But there were no African-American images raised up in the downtown area before I commissioned the statue to be placed in front of City Hall. I did the same thing in the, in the, in the Capitol, placing a portrait of the first African-American uh, in 93, uh, uh, William Webb Ferguson. We have to place these images in front of our children so they can see likenesses of themselves, so they can see the greatness that they have. we got to lay down the elements of strife and on these high places. And that's why I've always extend the olive branch out. You won't hear words of discontent or stress 
uh, causing stress in our community along those lines. But now I want to shift topics really quickly. We're emerging from our winter months, colder months, where it takes real, uh, a real, uh, you know, a, a beating. Our streets take a beating. Our infrastructure takes a beating. We have a lot of potholes. Right now, I have Transportation Director Rob Magaha here to tell you us how we can engage in reporting potholes and how to get those potholes filled. We've been doing a fantastic job inside the city of Flint over the last couple of years, in spite of all of our challenges, to remove snow. Yes, we know it got better to clean streets, to put street sweepers back out there that had not been out there prior to the Rob Maga, uh, is the asphalt plants opening up for what the hot patches are versus cold patches? Good morning, Rob. <clears throat> Yes, uh, the asphalt plant is opening up this Monday. So we will finally get some hot mac down on the, on the asphalt. Right now we've been putting coal patch down and we fill in one pile hole and two more break open. So I'm hoping by the end of this week, we can get a good grip on those pile holes. Right, how can people report the potholes when they are uh, coming across them? Because even our governor talked about fixing those roads. I won't use the word that she used, but infrastructure money is coming from the White House and we've been doing a great job here. And I want to just uh, for you to articulate the difference between a cold patch and a hot patch. Well, the cold patch is something that we get in the, in the cold months. The hot patch is not available and it just does not last very long. We fill a pothole and after traffic hits it so many times, it just breaks open. So now we're going to transform into hot permanent fix on our roadways. Right. And, and the streets that's going to be repaired. We're going to be looking at uh, how many streets uh, this summer are we looking at repairing and uh, paving? I seen the list and I, I want to say there's 12 to 15 streets on the list. I just I do not know the exact miles. But, yes, we're going to start paving here this month. Right. And there is a system to the way that we engage this. And uh, people have to be understanding about how it works. You know, major trunk lines state roadways are in uh, county streets are taken care of by the county and those in, uh, and those other entities local streets which is a residential streets that we have inside the city of flint we take care of those and and rod what is a good number they can call to report potholes it, it will be 810-766-7135 and just wait for the street maintenance division uh you just have to hit a number when it's when it calls for the street maintenance division and just leave your message on that and we will respond to it Okay, it's more time on number. 810-766-7135. Right. And so we understand the level of frustrations and we have practice fault finders out there in the world sometimes, but we're doing a fantastic job with the hardworking men and women uh, that works to provide a level of service for residents inside the community. We have just negotiated the first contract that they had uh, in more than 10 years. Uh, we've been effectively, and those are the workers that work for Rod out there on the street, uh, local 1600 asked me, uh, that's providing that level of service. They've been working without a contract uh, for more than a decade. Um, and so they have not been able to get that. But we have now put the uh, the negotiating tactics and tools to provide them a lovable uh, wage and, and providing them with some compensation that's equal to the value that they bring. Uh, and so we're happy that we've been able to negotiate the terms. We've been doing real work here in the city of Flint uh, through the intersection of crisis. We're going to continue to do so. Today we have uh, another social movement is a uh, and Amelia and I self celebrate mothers after losing our mothers. We we channeled our our pain and and our grief to celebrating mothers, and we'll be doing so at Hasselbrink Center this morning at twelve forty five to uh, I'm sorry at ten forty five to twelve thirty uh, celebrating mothers, treating mothers to a brunch. This is for mothers. Uh, so if you want to come out from ten forty five to twelve thirty uh, today, we're celebrating mothers. One of the things that I told. My mother is that I love her every single week. And one of the traditions that we had was we go, went out every Saturday morning for breakfast. Uh, we now are doing that. And so come out in the social programming and, and learn about what we're doing inside the city of Flint. Pay attention out there, what's going on, uh, about the reality of it. We can't afford to go backwards. We always need to continue to move forward. Our children are dependent on it, on it and we will continue to provide good information and good leadership as we have been. Stay away from... Uh, uh, the things that will cause us stress and grief moving forward. Uh, be kind to someone. Think positive. Mom, thank you, WFLT. Uh, I'm not turning it back into your capable hands. And thank all of my guests. See you guys. See you mothers. Love you, Mom. God bless.
So thank you guys. A great show. Great show.